over the last month or so, we've been putting out a few films uh, that we shot with Ken Wilber and the Integral Philosopher. And they've had a lot of views, a lot of really interesting comments, a lot of really interesting feedback, both in the comments on the videos and also kind of on some of the Integral forums. And we're recording this because we wanted to kind of talk about why we think that Ken's work is so significant, why the Integral work is so significant and also why, where we see it fitting into the conversation that's kind of emergent at the moment. We talked to John Vivekey about this quite recently and John Vivekey also kind of has this sense there's the potential for the integration of a lot of the wisdom traditions of the past with modern science, cognitive science in his perspective, but also this kind of map that Integral talked about a long time ago there could be a sense that this is the time that Integral talked about. Like Integral, and we're also going to explain a few of the sort of key concepts of Integral, why we think they're relevant and why we think that they, they illustrate or illuminate what's happening at the moment. And one of the key points is that Integral predicted that there would be a kind of new level of consciousness called Integral that would be able to... Um, where a lot of the paradoxes of previous levels of consciousness would be resolved and the, sort of, uh, the potential for a new synthesis would, would come about. And I think it's worth just even if we rewind all the way to what, what is integral because it's quite a complicated um, philosophy for, for anyone looking from the outside who hasn't engaged with it. But, um, and why does it matter to the conversation we've been covering? Like how does it relate to the intellectual dark web phenomena and, and everything else we've had on the channel? Um, I think if I had to break it down in incredibly simple terms, I think one of the things that Integral is about as a kind of philosophical uh, model is that we as people and as societies never stop developing and growing. We keep evolving. So it's interesting because in, in our culture we have no problem recognizing that an eight-year-old is different in many ways to an 18-year-old. Just, you know, we develop. But we have this sense that um, at some point in our early 20s, maybe, we just stop developing and we're just an adult then. Um, integral points out, and not just integral, it's worth saying. So there's lots of different developmental models, people like Robert Keegan and many, many more. Um, a lot of people have put a lot of work into looking at how do we develop over time. And I suppose the genius of Ken Wilber and, and integral is that he made, amongst other things, a map of maps. So he took all, not all of them, but many, many, many different developmental models and synthesized them into one meta model, I suppose. Um, so, and why I think that's important is just um, before we go into the, the different aspects of it, having a framework on the world and what's happening in our culture and why people can't get along with each other and all the, the polarity we're seeing, having a developmental model as a map, the map is not the territory, this is also probably another thing we should talk about, but having that model makes things easier to navigate and understand, in my opinion. Has been, certainly for me, I think for us in general with the channel, it's been quite a useful filter through which to see and understand more about what's going on in the culture right now. Yeah, and it's important as well to sort of just take a step back as well, because I think one of the the problems with integral is that because there's a lot of cognitive framework, there's the colors, there's the different quadrants, it can get very, the, the conversation can become very jargon heavy very quickly and it can become a very inside baseball kind of conversation as you'll see if you go to any of the integral sites. Um, and so, but this, but this developmental piece, the idea that how we think in t is as important as what we're thinking, which is also what John Viveki is also talking about quite a lot, which is really interesting, um, with cognitive science, is at least as important because it, it actually frames what we think far more than we realise. And, that that, and our sense is that that developmental piece is a key ingredient in the evolving conversation that the intellectual dark web is a part of, we're a part of, this sense that people have where the conversation is going somewhere there is a need for a developmental, the developmental piece is such a key part of that. Yeah. And Integral is, is, is probably the best known school that deals with the developmental model, but it's not the only one. And it's also, for example, Jean Piaget, who was, um, Jordan Peterson talks about as a key influence. 
uh, looked at kind of how children develop uh, as a but also his ultimate aim was to unite science and ethics, religion, morality, and was able to do that in a way of kind of looking at how we develop. Mm. So I think it's important to put the sort of flag there and say that it's not just about integral. And also I think what we're interested in doing, and I've seen a few people reflect on this on, online, it's like, is now a good time to look at the legacy of integral? Yeah. Like what it's, what it's done really well, what it's done less, less well. And I think so, and I think that's something that we're interested in looking at. Yeah. We've got an interview with Jamie Wheel coming up, uh, who's one of our kind of real, who's been a star of, of, of the channel for quite a while, and also has a real history with Integral. He was part of um, kind of the Integral movement from quite a, a while ago. So I'm just going to play a, a clip from him that we've got in the, of the film that's coming up. It seems to be the case as we move into these you know, nominally transpersonal communities is that all of the thought leaders who have been breaking trail, right, they, they, brought, they brought through something profound, something unique, something useful. They're bringing a tool to our shared collective and by default and or by design, we're all wounded healers. We all need the thing that we've built more than anybody else needs it. And I think that that same case is probably true for Ken. And rather than having the people who have experienced and benefited from integral theory then rise up in some sort of unreconciled, slay the father, angry child dynamic, can there be instead the sense of, hey, wow, your life's work has lit things up in me has helped guide my path, right? has brought me to places I never had imagined, and perhaps can we then turn around and give back the wounded healer the realized gift that they offered in the first place. And not needs to not, no need to knock them down off pedestals and no need to kind of reclaim our gold in kind of angry and dysfunctional ways, but to say thank you so much and let us return the favor, let us return academic acknowledgement, let us return community, let us return love, appreciation, affection, and challenge. Let us show up as the humans you've been writing about all along, and let's help you take that final step for yourself. We don't all need all of our teachers to be Moses, leading people to the promised land and getting stuck on the edge. We can actually welcome the folks that help guide us to that land, to, to the party itself. So the connection with Ken came out quite synchronistically because we wrote a piece on the intellectual dark web as an emerging integral conversation. And it became kind of one of the most read articles that I've put on Medium. And in that, sort of about halfway down, I talked about how the integral framework was really useful to, to look at what was going on and how the intellectual dark web could be seen as an emerging integral conversation. And Ken read that and also read a piece in that where I think I said, okay, we're gonna try and summarize integral theory in three paragraphs. And you actually wrote that piece. And he said, he read that, like someone's gonna summarize integral theory in three paragraphs. I was like, I'd like to see you try. And actually was quite impressed that uh, it was a pretty good job of, of interpreting integral theory in a very short space of time. So he got in touch um, with us, or Ken's people got in touch with us and suggested an interview. And the interview was a, like a four and a half hour epic, which if you want to see in full, you can see by becoming a subscriber. And then we turned it into three documentaries, the Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson and the Evolution of Thought, which is the central one that's had about 80,000 views. Then another one called the Intellectual Dark Web and Integral Conversation, and then another one, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, how integral theory can illustrate their different conceptions of truth. I think that points to another useful aspect of integral, is that it, has a, it provides a map of reality. Again, it's a map, not the territory. Um, and there, to put it very, very simply, it's kind of a four-quadrant model, but it divides into the, the kind of inner experience and the outer experience that we can have. So my inner experience of being me, 
and the subjective reality of that has its own language and a way of inquiring into that and studying that and our shared uh, understanding of the outside world uh, that has its own language of the language of science of you know measurement and those are great those it's it's always yes and with integral those two aspects of reality they're not mutually exclusive they're both happening at the same time um, and when for example with Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris they were talking from those two different quadrants in this model so that in integral that can't work because there's different language there's a different kind of order of thinking required and you can't collapse one no. truth claim into the other truth claim so exactly. science does not uh, and that's often what happens with science where they just don't accept the the reality of the interior experience yes yeah exactly and so that's a, that's a key you know that's an example of where this model can be used to have a better understanding of you know, in particular, why can't people agree on something? I find that very interesting thing, especially in a very polarized environment. It's easier for us to agree on things if we can parse out, go, okay, well, this is an internal experience. I'm trying to apply it to something else. That's not going to work. I just have to really, it's holding lots of different things in your mind and in your awareness at the same time. So, so Jordan Peterson famously kind of is always going on about postmodernism and the, the kind of pathologies of postmodernism. What's really interesting is that Ken Wilber actually diagnosed what he called boomeritis mm. back a couple of decades ago. And, and at the time, so, so Ken's conception of where that goes wrong, I think is much more sophisticated than Jordan Peterson's. I think Jordan Peterson can become quite one dimensional when he talks about postmodernism and he doesn't seem to appreciate or at least doesn't speak to the value of postmodernism, mm. that actually there was a stage where it was quite there, there is some use in it. There is a pathology about it when it dissolved into relativism and to kind of the, the associated narcissism mm -hmm. that, that Ken talks about. But Ken also, Ken dis diagnosed a long time ago like that this particular way of looking at the world that he called green, mm -hmm. kind of multi-perspectival, respecting sort of different perspectives, had the potential to go bad that mm -hmm. he called boomeritis and diagnosed that that would mean that it would effectively collapse into if this sort of paradox of no, no truth claim is, is kind of canonical, becomes all truth claims are equally valid, and then eventually you just collapse into this kind of morass of relativism. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that a lot of people at the time when Ken was saying this were sort of saying, oh, he's going, over the deep, he's going off the deep end, it's not going to be that bad. Now it's quite clear, like the pathology of green, the pathology of postmodernism is so rampant that a lot of people are now saying, whoa, he was, he was very prescient. He actually spotted it a long time ago and, and has been borne out by what's been happening in the culture since. I think it's re that's a really nice example because it applies to where we might be going. I think with any developmental model is very useful because if you look at when green, the, this kind of pluralistic, relativistic, uh, how it arose, it, it arose against the context of like the 1950s and everything that had come before that. And just, I think it's often good to put oneself back in that world where there was segregation, where there was very rigid thought structures, where, you know, that was an incredibly cutting edge, inspiring, you know, civil rights comes out of it, art starts to change, there's a freeing of sexual uh, mores and there's, uh, people are experimenting with their consciousness. Like, that is a natural developmental, it's like a teenager getting a, finally being free from a really stifling home. It's a natural developmental thing. And yes, it went sour, for sure. But what's interesting for me is that you can look at that in context, it adds a certain um, understanding and compassion, which I think is needed for us ever, any of us ever getting into a proper dialogue where something new can emerge, instead of being in our kind of ideological camps. In the same way, I wouldn't berate an eight-year-old for not being particularly good at uh, drawing a square because they're an eight-year-old, you know? And so we all as human beings and as cultures go through processes. And then the question is, okay, where are we going now? How can we use that to kind of understand what's happening right now and where we might be going? I, I, in, in a sense, we never know where we're going. You don't know what the next, this is, you never know what the next stage is. You don't, but at the same time, there is a sense, I think, from a lot of people who are following our content and we're in dialogue with that there is a sense of there's a teleology to this conversation there's a tel there's, there is a sense that a lot of people have that it is going somewhere yes that it came from 
the, like we saw the, the kind of eruption and the, the, the phenomenon of Jordan Peterson. We've seen a real kind of intellectual awakening online. The intellectual dark web is one manifestation of that, mm. the kind of this bottom-up sense-making process uh, coming out. And I mean, my sense of where it's going, and also John Bavaki pretty much confirmed yeah. that in our recent interview, mm. is a conscious reintegration of, of the wisdom traditions and, and a, the potential for a grand synthesis, which I think a lot of us are really sensing. It's like, okay, there's a real sense of that coming. Yeah. And also what we really found was like, Ken Wilbur is a really important voice to be part of this conversation. Yeah. And that was ultimately our aim with mm. doing the interview with him, is to bring him into this conversation. And I think, um, I mean, we'll, we'll see where it goes from here. But the interesting thing as well is that it's, it's now a very networked, decentralized, two-way process. Mm. And I think that's very different from how it probably was back in the days when Integral was first arising. Yeah. It's also interesting, a lot of, the, a lot of our sort of most um, dedicated followers and a lot of our subscribers as well are mm. also have a history with Integral. Yeah. There's a sense of that there is, it's very attractive to people who are trying to make sense of the world in terms of big picture, big patterns, yeah. and they, they, I think they also recognize that's what we're trying to do with, mm. with Rebel Wisdom, mm. is to create a sense-making enterprise and to try and put, see, okay, how does this fit? Yeah. So, for example, Jamie Wheel uh, is a good example. It's like, Jamie Wheel, for me, is holding a really crucial piece around flow, sp flow states, mm. embodied wisdom, transformational stuff, which is as far as I can see, kind of, he, he's holding that particular piece in the constellation and the, um, yeah, the constellation that we're aware of, and different people are holding different places. Mm -hmm. But I think what's interesting now is that it's a much more two-way conversation. And I, I wonder, I think Ken and the people around him, I would invite them to, to, to enter that conversation more yeah. in a two-way process. And, and I'm not sure that that's something that the, the Integral has had before in that same way. Mm, yeah, and I think, I think it's a key point because, you know, uh, we've talked a lot, we've, we've had people like Jordan Greenhall, Daniel Schmachtenberger on the channel talking about the importance of this decentralized collective intelligence as, as an antidote to the collapse of the institutions that aren't really working right now in our society. We need to decentralize and get into this mode where something new emerges through the interaction between us. And implicit in that, is this level of openness uh, and this level of um, not quite knowing the answer and feeding back to one another. And this is what we're trying to do at the, the Rebel Wisdom Summit as well. It's this, this kind of process and to really land that. Um, uh, yeah, it's shifting, from, as Jordan Greenhall would say, it's shifting from this broadcast modality yeah. to a more networked collective modality. Yeah. And that has to happen as individuals. Yeah. As individuals, we can get stuck in a broadcast mode and we're yeah. just broadcasting to each other. Yeah rather than trying to make sense together. And I think that's the next mm. process. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, and just something else that just comes up in terms of why people have traditionally been very interested in Integral is that it's also a map or a model that allows for what we were just talking about, allows for those other states to come in. You know, that, that kind of getting into this liminal space and for spiritual experience and mystical experiences to be contextualized in quite, it largely quite a useful way. Whereas the opposite of that is someone has these experiences or gets into these states and the only avenue is some kind of new age crankery that tries to interpret it. You know, that's what I've, one of the things I found very useful about Integral, um, you know, understanding how to deal with a shadow, understanding um, how to, you know, the, the relationship between states we can get into, like the flow state and how we then interpret the world. You know, we interpret that state at whatever stage we're at. So there's lots of very useful stuff in there that allows for a kind of maybe a more mature understanding of um, the metaphysical, let's say. So yeah, we're really interested in exploring the legacy of Integral. And the first person I thought to call was Jamie Wheel, because Jamie, Jamie I knew had a big history with Integral going back quite a long time, and is also kind of one of the most impressive thinkers that we've interviewed in the time that we've been doing the channel. If you haven't watched his piece, uh, Stealing Fire from the Gods, then you should, because it's amazing. And he, he had quite a lot of appreciation, but also quite a few criticisms of Integral. And I think it's, it's, it's got to be done. I think it's time for 
if we're going to do this properly, we need to, to bring that level of kind of transparency and honesty to this is what Integral did really well, this is what Integral didn't do so well. And, and so that's, what, that's the kind of conversation that we're interested in, in hosting, is, is both sides of the coin. Yeah, I, I think something Jamie said as well is that there's a lot of people walking around running Integral OS, like an operating system. You know, I'd class myself as one of those people. Um, and I think that, that it, there's a necessary distinction between Integral OS and when Integral becomes um, the only map someone is using, for example. You know, there, there, one of the um, difficulties in Integral communities is that, this, that those very complex things, uh, levels of you know, different models, there's spiral dynamics, there's all these different things, they can um, A, be kind of hijacked by the ego, so we can hide in them, in a sense, and B, they can create shadows of their own, because it's very common for people to kind of accuse each other of being not integral. You know, this happens quite a lot, and that's something I think... It's a very first tier thing to say, Ali. <laughs> yeah. This is something I think needs to be, I think a lot of people in the integral communities are aware of it, but I think it just needs to be out and explicit and explored. This is yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, if you spend any time on any integral forum, you'll see that kind of integral one-upmanship. Yes. Like, yeah. I'm more second tier than you. Yeah. And so, that, I mean, there is a difficulty and a danger within all of these developmental maps. Uh, like, I think we need to recover hierarchy. Like, we have sort of, one of the insights of integral is that we've had a green postmodern consciousness that's obliterated all hierarchies and so we're in flatland yeah. and we can't navigate because we don't know what up is. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, implicit in any hierarchies is it, it's a dangerous business because you're automatically in some sense creating this, di this dynamic of I'm more developed than you. It's very, it's very, mm. that it, it's a very difficult space to navigate. Yeah, uh, the irony is that uh, it's uh, that whole model of saying yes and and going to the next stage and then like Russian dolls kind of growing more and more integrated is is based mainly on empathy for the pre, you know, the, and and there's not, I have not seen a huge amount of empathy sometimes in a lot of the integral communities, you know, um, and yeah, like we were talking before about you know, the movement from the 1950s to this kind of green pluralistic modality. Um, I think Jeff Salzman pointed out that a lot of people missed out, who were born after that, missed out on the traditional values. So that's a good example of it. You don't say, oh no, screw that, like we, you know, screw the 1950s, we were wrong, we're going to go into another thing. It's, yes, there's truth in that, and let's integrate that. Where's my own traditionalism? Where's my own morality that maps more to that? Hold it, integrate it, have it as part of myself and also have the pluralistic side as part of myself and all the other bits and pieces. All of that relies on empathy and openness, genuine empathy and openness. And if it can't, like that, that's the place to start, I think. And I think that's where I'd like to see the conversation go as well. And, and for all of us who are interested in this, to ask hard questions of ourselves. Am I, really, am I really coming from a place of openness or am I coming from a place of, you know, like that word you mentioned, one-upsmanship? So yeah, the Jamie Wheel piece about the legacy of Integral is going out pretty much at the same time as this, uh, or very shortly afterwards. And yeah, we're going we're gonna to see, I'm interested in doing maybe another couple of interviews about the legacy of Integral, people who might have something really worthwhile to talk about, kind of uh, developmental thinking, why it's useful, where it can go wrong, yeah. kind of the lessons that we can learn from the past. And, for example, Robert Keegan is a very well-known Harvard developmental psychologist who hopefully we've got an interview with coming up at the end of April. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, interested in sort of seeing where this conversation is going and the developmental piece being just something absolutely crucial to bring in. So just some quick updates to close. We have the Rebel Wisdom Summit coming up on the 12th of May, which is a one-day event with uh, Jordan Greenhall, uh, Ian McGilchrist, Brett Weinstein, and Heather Hying. And so, very excited about that, and thank you to everyone who's coming. It's sold out now. Um, it's going to be about 150 people. And the first of what we hope will be many spaces where we can get into this kind of collaborative uh, conversation where uh, we practice really seeing we can let something emerge between us that's more than the sum of our parts. So, uh, as well as that, separately, we have finally, after many months, set up the Rebel Wisdom Store. 
So if anyone likes the t-shirts that we sometimes wear in the videos and just would like a t-shirt, or even uh, we even have baby onesies and all sorts. So uh, we'll put that a link to that in the show notes and um, membership. So we've put a load more content on for subscribers. We've got a couple of really great pieces with uh, Jeffrey Miller and Diana Fleischman, including the poly professors. Uh, which polyamorous professors, I should say, which is going to be, which is still a member exclusive for a little bit longer. It will go on the main channel, but member exclusive, if you want to see it early. And an amazing piece with Jeffrey called the Neurodiversity Case for Free Speech, which I think is one of the best arguments I've heard for a long time. And what else have we got on there? We've got the whole four and a half hour Ken Wilber interview. And we have, yeah, an, a really excellent extra piece with John Viveki on flow states and psychedelics. So if you want to see those, go and become a subscriber. And also, yeah, if you subscribe at a high enough level, you can also join the regular Zoom calls that we do with other people in the community. And that is becoming increasingly, yeah, a good source of kind of collaborative sense-making between everyone who's on those calls. So yeah, come and join the community. See you soon.